What's up? I am your host, Noah Thomas, and you are watching High Snobiety Jazz TV. Coming to you now is a special DJ set by Mr. Toshio Matsura. Jazz changed my life. Jazz saved my life. Back in spring in 1986, I was 19. The scene and the music, I experienced that Japanese fashion designer, Takeo Kikuchi's fashion show in Tokyo, with the DJ and jazz dancers from London. The DJ was Paul Murphy, and the dancers were jazz directors. It began with the jazz trumpeter, Kenny Doham's aphrodisia was liberated through the venue and that moment, three dancers who tied up with a hat jumped out on the catwalk. I was fascinated. That was like a having a heavy electric shock through my body, and I was so thrilled that I couldn't breathe, and I just kept starting at the dance with which I've never seen such an elegant and beautiful dance in my life. Since that day, I was really attracted to the scene of the dance with jazz, and a few years later, I formed a DJ unit called the UFO, and started the first ever jazz club night in Japan. Then, I have traveled and played at the clubs and the festivals all over the world. 34 years since then, I'm so glad that I'm still having a life searching for the fresh music, which makes me feel numb and carefree, selecting, introducing, and sharing it with you. The world is suffering from a new virus, and DJ, musician, and many people who are involved in music are having a hard time. Tough times bring opportunity. Let's get over these lagging waves with the new ideas and good music, because I believe that jazz is experience. Jazz is a surprise. Jazz is a taking risks Venture into the unknown. Attitude. No sound is too taboo. City and love. I love jazz. We love jazz. Toshio Matsura from Tokyo.
John Coltrane was a vessel taking us to the house of God. He spoke to God in the language God knew. The language of sound. Use his horn to talk to God. the love he had for him by loving us with his sounds a divine love
Do you guys wear t-shirts? I know I do. <laughs> and man, do we have some options for you. We've got the ensemble tee, the staff tee, the horn monster tee, and the Newport Jazz tee. These could all be yours for a limited time. Also, a portion of the proceeds are helping the Newport Jazz COVID Relief Fund, which is helping musicians during these tough times. Act fast. It's, it's right. here. Let's get it. <laughs> Marcus, thank yeah. you for bringing us together, man. This is exciting. Yeah, no, thank all you. thanks to y'all. All thanks to y'all. Like, the only thing I did, they asked me, you know, oh, who, who's like your wish list, your fan list? And I was like, oh, I scribbled that right away. So everybody on this call, you know, it's like I'm I'm huge fans of y'all, not to make it, you know, not to fan out too much, but yeah, man. So thank you for taking the time. Yeah, we can start with the introductions. I'll go. Um, I won't make it too long. Uh, my name is uh, Marcus J. Moore. Uh, I am a Brooklyn-based and Nairobi, Kenya-based uh, music journalist and author with a book that just came out yesterday. Uh, the Butterfly Effect, How Kendrick Lamar Ignited the Soul of Black America. Um, you know, other than that, I cover jazz, you know, more so like spiritual jazz and all kinds of crazy stuff for the New York Times and Bandcamp and NPR and so forth. So if we could just go from there, Nate, if you can kick it off, you know. Uh, thank you, Marcus, and congratulations again on, on the book. It's very exciting. Um, uh, my name is Nate Chenen. Uh, I am the author of Playing Changes, Jazz for the New Century. Um, I am ex-New York Times, uh, ex-Jazz Times, uh, now the director of editorial content at WBGO and a contributor to NPR Music. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm also a, a, a part of the extended Newport Jazz Festival family um, as the, uh, someone who used to work with George Ween and, and co-authored his book. This is my, my Newport Jazz streaming shirt from this summer. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it's all in the family. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Right on. Nubaya, tell us what you got going. Oh, yeah. Um, my name is Nubaya Garcia, and I'm a musician. Um, my main instrument is tenor saxophone. Um, I'm a band leader, composer, um, performer, and music, huge music enthusiast, obviously. But I think it's always important to say how much I love what I do. Um, and I just put an album out uh, like a month and a half ago, my first debut solo thing. So still like riding high from that, even though I can't really play it at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'm just feeling very thankful um, to have that opportunity to put out um, part one of my story, I guess. Uh, so yeah, that's that's me in a, in a nutshell. Right on. Chief, I see you over there with all the drums. Tell, tell us a little bit more about yourself. All right, well, I'm Christian Scott Atunde Adjo. I'm a trumpeter, composer. I produce music as well. Um, I own and operate an app company and a record label called Stretch Music. Um, and I'm a band leader as well. Uh, for people that know me more intimately, I'm also a chieftain in the Black tribes of New Orleans. And, uh, and I am currently in Los Angeles. Right on. My man Gio, what's going on? Hey, uh, I'm Gio Rusinello. Uh, I cover jazz, stretch music, experimental music, all related things um, musically. 
uh, and music adjacent uh, for the New York Times. And I also write about politics. Um, and uh, I'm very much digging your hoodie, Marcus. I'm a fellow DMV native and uh, I run a small organization there called Capital Bop, which advocates for the music and tries to keep it uh, thriving in DC. Hey man, thank you, man. Uh, and of course, PG all day, PG Maryland all day. So you know what it is. Now, I wanted, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to start like I was saying. Um, obviously, the year twenty twenty, I feel like it's felt like it's felt like five years rolled into one. So music aside, writing aside, I just want to get into a conversation about how we're how we're navigating it. You know, how, how is everybody? I know it's a broad question. How's everybody feeling at the moment? You know, because obviously we're still taking in all the stimuli. We, we still have to, you know, look at the news and deal with politics and things like that. So just on the human level, how's everybody holding up? Like, um, and whoever can jump in. Is it too early for a drink? <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. Not it's yet. always five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> yeah. No, all right, it's just about four there, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to be on London time right now. I mean, I, I guess I'll start. Um, th this has been a, uh, a year of, of um, it hasn't all been bad. You know, it's been highs and lows for me. Um, the lows have been very, very low and, and there've been a lot of them. Um, but, you know, it's also been a time of like, you know, like for those of us with, with families at home, you know, it's, it's a very sweet time uh, with my two kids. Um, and you know, I, I was just telling someone this, it's been kind of an amazing year for improvised music. Um, so much good stuff has, has come out, you know, including um, by Nubaya and by Christian. I mean, I, I feel very inspired by what's happening right now. And so, so it's this constant mixed feeling, you know, just, I, I feel like I'm always trying to process the news and, maintain sanity and and you know everything else um but at the same time there's the music is is sustaining you know um maybe a little later we can talk about a, a story i have from april that involves me and geo um but I, I don't have to go there right now that that's on the darker side i just mm -hmm. wanted to say like yes yeah, it's, it's been ups and downs yeah so um Nubai, how about you how, how's everything going um same really like extreme highs um lots of lows I feel this has been a huge time of reflection for me um this whole year actually even before uh lockdown kind of began um and we entered that kind of stage of things I think I've been on the road for two years prior to the beginning of this year so I came home and felt like a huge like wow I'm finally home and then that turned into like, I'm always home <laughs> because, you know, nothing's really going on outside. Um, so in that, there was a lot of time for reflection and thought on, you know, what do I value basically? And what do I represent? And what am I trying to say in the actions that I do, the music that I make, the people that I surround myself with, what can I give? Um, to my community other than music like so that's been a lot um but also like really encouraging to know that I do have a community of wondrous souls around me musical and otherwise and all around the world um so yeah I think it's just been a lot 2020 has been a lot it's been like pow 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 all the time and um I'm just mm. taking each day as it comes trying not to um, overwhelm myself with uh, everything that's on the internet and um, learning a new kindness to myself. Yeah. Now, um, if Gio, I saw you shaking your head. And, and the thing that I've always appreciated about your writing and you too, Nate, where even though, you know, uh, just by definition, we're, you know, journalists, right? And we're not supposed to, by, by historical definitions, we're not supposed to really feel, we're supposed to just kind of Talk about what's going on and that's that. Maybe that's an archaic model, but that's kind of the newsrooms I, I came up in. But but Gio, if you could talk a little bit about like 
um, how do you how do you bring in all of what's happening in the world and spin it into what you're writing? Because what I was trying to say is, I feel like your writing is very emotive, you know, mm -hmm. and you can you can definitely feel the spirit in whoever you're covering in your writing. So how do you how do you how do you bring all of that in and still remain sane enough to write on deadline? <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you. And the, the compliment is repaid in, in double your way, I would say for sure. Um, and I think you're right that we both uh, probably have looked at history in terms of music writing and seen a lot of traps that we could fall into and maybe think about uh, new ways to do it and new ways to try at least to um, imagine our way into what we're covering uh, and listen our way into what we're covering as opposed to judging or categorizing or things like that, um, which is always a challenge. And I find myself falling down in that challenge all the time. Um, simply, you know, the, the power of history and the weakness of one person or, or whatever. But uh, I do think that, yeah, you're right. That's a goal. And I think uh, in some ways covering politics alongside music, um, politics with a capital P, you know, kind of within the terror dome of what we consider American politics these days um, has helped and hurt at the same time for me um, because it does foreshorten your imagination in a lot of ways um, to be writing about the same cast of kind of prefabricated characters that waltz down the hallways in Washington DC every day. Um, so, cause I don't know, people, I'm sure most people watching this are not totally familiar with what I I cover but literally I mean I cover day-to-day -day politics like the Washington grind you know <laughs> and then I also am writing about some of the most mind expanding and um and like really future opening music that I think we have um it really does come down to like trying to listen as opposed to see um for me and seeing I think of as a kind of categorizing a kind of gaze listening I think of as um, a much deeper interaction and one of receptivity and, and one of uh, kind of giving yourself over um, and I think um, if you can really like bring yourself fully to the task of, of, of just being open and trying to learn from the material um, then you can get a lot further than if you try to bring in if you think of yourself as a quote-unquote expert who brings in um, a set of assumptions, you know, knowledge becomes assumptions really quickly in that way. So anyway, I guess to be brief about it, I would just say, um, this has been an amazing year to do a lot of listening. Um, this has been a really incredible time to try to humble myself as much as possible. Um, because in that process, I've learned, I've been able to go back through history, I think, because the news cycle has kind of churned down to a standstill in a lot of ways, although Nate rightly makes the point that these musicians that we have out here are doing incredible work under these circumstances, putting out amazing records, finding ways to do their thing online, do it distanced, make Brooklyn where I live into an amazing habitat of spontaneous musical creativity, like walking down the street. So this, this has been an amazing time, but I think being able to do some historical research into the role of protest, for instance, in music, in this music specifically, um, has really just been a time to redouble my efforts to sort of, you know, learn. Um, and as Nubaya was articulating, I think that, that it often can make you think in extra musical or paramusical ways about what your contribution might be. And, and I've found myself questioning my role as a writer much more. That's another conversation. And, and, and just thinking about how to throw in your kind of your weight into struggle a little more directly. Um, but maybe we'll get to that later. Yeah, and, and while you were talking, um, it reminded me, uh, Chief, like when, when I listen to your music, man, and I, I don't, I don't spit, spit hyperbole at all. Like I've never heard anybody play horn the way that you play it. And when folks that don't come from the sort of linearly come from that cultural space are speaking and opining and projecting people as being like the anointed ones or the kings or queens of this music without actually having or being rooted or grounded in that knowledge and that information, it's also really dangerous, right? So I'll, sort of to what Gio is saying and also what Nate is intimating and is writing in certain spaces, part of what also needs to be reevaluated is who is speaking and why, right? And it's, it's the same thing musically. And that's not to say that 
people do not have the right to opine and to conjecture about what it is that they're hearing um, from, you know, that's not what I mean, but really more of what I'm speaking to is that if you are going to actually, you know, be a gatekeeper to a, in a certain sense, if you're going to be in that position, then to make sure that you have as much information as possible and that you go to the actual master level people in that industry or in that culture before you're actually saying some of the things that you're actually saying. And so that's also part of what we're protesting. That's also a component to decolonializing this music as well. And I know that those, that answer is very wide, but I think it's important to also be really clear and give comprehensive answers about what we know or the impediments to moving forward. And so that's a huge part of the reevaluation that we're doing in this moment as well. Just a, a quick aside, then I'm gonna get out the way and ask the question. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because the book that I came out with yesterday, the subtitle is How Kendrick Lamar Ignited the Soul of Black America, right? <laughs> so what I'm noticing so far is that the reviews are totally split along racial lines, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's black people who are like, oh, I get it. You're talking about, you're talking about jazz. You're talking about Black Lives Matter. You're talking about all this stuff. White critics aren't really diving into that. They were more so looking for the standard celebrity bio. You know, for page one, Kendrick Lamar was born in his hospital. Page 250, here he is now with the Pulitzer. And it wasn't that. So that, so you saying that now was totally singing my song, man, because I've been noticing that um, right away. So yeah, that was like, um, sorry, yeah. no, that that was like the the initial reaction to ancestral recall. It's like in a nutshell, it was split, you know. And I and I think it it you know to be clear and to be fair, I think a lot of that is also like I said, is based in people's perceptions that are not usually being built by the practitioners, right? So, so that's a, a big part component to this as well is that when we project a narrative that, that tries to define jazz as being, and this is what I learned in New Orleans as a younger person in school, but not in the spaces where you actually learn the music, but the projection of the music is that it is West African harmony, right? And Europe, I mean, West African rhythm, excuse me, and European harmony. Traditionally, if you go into a classroom in the jazz study space, that's what they're going to say. Jazz is a, a fusion of African harmony and African rhythm, excuse me, and European harmony. And part of the problem with these sort of ideas is that it creates this really weird chasm and this energy that says, well, there's no harmony in West Africa, right? Or that those people that came here did not have those types of traditions. Now, you and I both know that if we go and we walk around in Bamako, you'll hear somebody playing Ingoni and what you'll hear them playing sounds frighteningly similar to Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters. So we know that those harmonic traditions actually existed in those spaces, but for the purposes of codifying this music as a classical form, they, there was a utility in framing it in the way that it's been framed. So when we made this record, in a sense, to try and create a document to decolonialize sound through rhythm and to show the harmonic tendencies that exist in rhythm and why that music is as nuanced and as sophisticated as other forms, then there was a, a bit of a fight back because it, there's this cognitive dissonance about with that narrative that's been projected and projected and projected that says that jazz is essentially also a byproduct of a well-tempered system. There's a piano behind you here, right? So well-tempered, obviously this is the Western European sort of uh, 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 how these instruments actually ring and vibrate harmonically is a very specific thing. Whereas if I'm playing an ingoni or I'm playing a kora or I'm playing a sitar, these instruments obviously are wavering in a completely different way. And so it doesn't make any room for that. So we, we thought it was necessary to try and create a space musically that also illuminated the actual core cultural space of this music in a way where you could hear it in the modern context. So, so yeah, I understand that you go through that. And that's something I think Mubai can probably say she's probably experienced to a certain degree as well. Yeah, and that's why I was going to go there. Um, uh, Nubai, if you could talk about that, then Nate, I have a question for you. But um, obviously, you know, Nubai, if you have a response to that, and then also I wanted to give you a space to, uh, you know, sort of tell us about what your what your music and what your album conveys. 
Um, yeah, I definitely agree with what you're both saying and definitely Christian. I think from my experience with dealing with, you know, since the album has come out, people talking about it, people writing about it, um, it's, and even the questions, actually, the questions that have been asked, they're obviously very similar, et cetera, but they kind of already, it feels like they already have a story that they have written or what they have deduced from the music and the way that I play. Mm -hmm. And even instrument, the instrument that I play, like I find it quite, yeah, perplexing that when I arrive to the conversation and the interview that it's usually, you know, oh, well, this is the saxophone's role in jazz and your album is a jazz album and this means this to me. And I think it's been, it's been a really interesting and difficult at times um, to navigate, actually. I'm not trying to run away from the jazz idiom. You know, I'm honored to be involved and thought worthy of the genre. Like, that's not the issue. The issue is that there's so much else in my album and um, there's so many other influences there's so much um there's a different culture that people just aren't really recognizing um within you know the caribbean um i'm from the caribbean and this whole album is me essentially navigating that trying to get back to the beginning as such in terms of my family my family's history the music that my parents grew up on the stories that my grandparents and my parents have told me about music and about life there. I didn't grow up there. I've been to Trinidad a lot. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm getting off topic, but I think I've just noticed that people have a an idea of what they think my music is. And that idea is about 20% of it or just a portion of it. And like you said, Christian, they've the narrative is so um, boxed it's like this is what this is and I'm like okay but what about all these other stuff I did a track in Colombia you know I did a Colombia track with a band from there it, like I mean it's just it's, it's quite interesting what's ignored and what isn't what is chosen to talk about and yeah I found it um quite hard to navigate in a way that doesn't like offend I find like when I kind of um come against those questions I'm like oh no actually you know this is this and and this is where this influence has come from and you know we have a, a Naya Bingi track and XYZ this is what this means to me and South sound system culture in London and the Caribbean is also completely throughout the whole fabric of the album that's like in my soul you know um, I'm a child of carnival and that you know. yeah it's just I feel like a lot of people don't know how to talk about that. Um, mm. People are not, I'm not just, this isn't just about journalists. Um, right. But I feel like people that are listening to the album as well are also like, oh no, but she plays jazz and this is what jazz is. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been an interesting process and I'm learning a lot of how to converse about something to educate without um without being what's the word like aggressive in the way that I try and explain something that's very close to my heart but someone else doesn't understand at all um yeah yeah <laughs> yeah can I can I hop in Marcus yeah uh, sorry I don't yeah, want to cut please. off Nate I know I know you've got it you had a question for Nate but there's just so much that I'm thinking about here and that resonates and um you know, it's been, it's definitely been a time to like reappraise one's relationship to the tradition that one's within like this year, but also hopefully always, you know, is, is a good moment for that. Um, and I think it, for me, like all these things you're describing, Nubaya and Christian, like all these things that you're describing feel related to um, that dichotomy that I've been trying to use that I mentioned before in terms of looking and gazing versus listening and, and hearing. Um, and I think that the, the taxonomizing, the labeling and the separating and the, and the, the sort of boxing um, is, is a, for, it's frankly a, a history of, of, it's a Western history and it's a history of um, claiming and conquering and, and labeling. And, and it's a history wherein 
turning something into a kind of commodity or a kind of property or a kind of thing that can be managed is, is the power. And the actual creation of the thing gets demoted, right? Mm. So if the creators are empowered, there's a lot less that matters about how you taxonomize it or how you label it or how you even understand it, you know, from a, you know, a mental standpoint, um, from, a, from a labeling standpoint. And I think that like this moment, I mean, it's sort of like, you can read, you can read a, a, a historian um, on the Great Migration, for instance. But like, if you read Beloved, you understand something so much richer because it's actually written from within an experience that's like way beyond the labels. I mean, it just breaks out of any kind of labeling, right? And it's like if we can actually write, use words about this music with the same level of richness. Um, and that's something that honestly, somebody in my position maybe never will be able to do. Um, but maybe there's a way to, to like write into the experience of listening from my perspective, that's as appreciative and as open and as learning oriented as, as one might hope, you know, as opposed to coming in and thinking that because I'm writing about this music, my role is to be an expert. I think there's a difference between being learned or being passionately engaged and being somebody who's posing as an expert and therefore is there to separate, taxonomize and assert, you know, it's-, it's I, a I have a point thing. there, um, Marcus. Yeah. I don't know if I'm, if I'm like- uh, No, 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 uh, go in, bro. Jumping on your question, but you know, so I, I guess I'm the old guy here today, right? <laughs> um, uh, I am, I am uh, approaching my mid forties. So that, that makes me the old man in this, uh, in this scenario. Uh, which is fine, I'll take it. But you know, the point I want to make is that some of what we're talking about are these, um, uh, you know, Gio, you mentioned uh, taxonomies. We're talking about sort of um, structures that are that are set up um, for the purpose of sorting and and kind of making sense of things. And that work is done by critics. It's done by historians, and then it's also done intentionally or unintentionally by the industry and this sort of app, the whole apparatus of commerce and everything, right? But I wanna talk about criticism specifically for a moment because um, I came up um, at a time when, you know, okay, here, is, here are the critical narratives and here are the models that we have. This is what jazz criticism is, right? Um, and I remember um, saying like, okay, Martin Williams, okay, it's time, to, it's time to really go deep on Martin Williams and figure this out, you know? And, and it happened at the same time that I was learning about the new criticism in, you know, in literature and, you know, sort of, it's all about the text. It's the, you know, intention doesn't matter, it's the text. And so there's this famous moment in, in sort of jazz criticism where Martin Williams um, decides that Sonny Rollins is just the paragon of thematic improvisation. And he says like this, you know, this is what it is, right? And he, he takes a track from um, Saxophone Colossus uh, that I'm sure I'm sure you both know. I'm sure everyone knows. Uh, Blue Seven, right? Mm. And he and he talks about the way that Sonny Rollins develops this this narrative and this structure in the solo, and and he talks about it in you know very formal terms. And then he basically says Blue Seven is a masterpiece. I mean that's literally he says Blue Seven is a masterpiece, right? Now you would imagine that that's a a really cool thing to hear if you're Sonny Rollins, mm -hmm. but if you ever talk to Sonny about this moment, you realize just how destabilizing and alien that idea is to him as a practitioner, as an artist, you know? And that was a really big lesson for me when, you know, when I had a chance to sit down with Sonny and talk about, about you know, how he sees this whole thing, you know? Um, he was not, he didn't reject Martin Williams's perspective, uh, you know, or his authority as a listener, you know, he appreciated that, but it's just a completely alien way of thinking about the creation of the music. Um, and, and I think that, that that was very instructive for me. Um, and, you know, going back to Gio's sort of binary between um, seeing and hearing, you know, um, I think you, you use the, the word humbled. Um, you know, humility is a big part of this equation. There is no way to really deeply uh, be listening without engaging in some humility, um, no matter how much of an expert you are. If you're listening, you are, you are being humble in some way. Um, 
you know, I mean, I, I guess there are critics you could point to and, and as, a, as exceptions to that rule, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, um, so, so I think that it has been really heartening to see, um, cause I do think some of this is generational. Um, it's been great to see a, a, a new model or a different model emerge that is much more attuned to cultural context, that is much more attuned to human experience um, and, and looks not only at the artist's intention, but also the whole web of relationships that this music um, operates within. Um, you know, how the audience um, receives and responds, you know, all, all of this, it's, it's, an, it's an ecology ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, everyone has a part to play in that uh, and no one can fully understand it or predict it, you know, like it's, you're just a part of it. And so that's, that's been a really useful uh, framework for me. It certainly informed my book and, and, it, and it's been a, a, a kind of a revelation for me, uh, let's say within the last decade or so. Um, and and it's, it's made me very happy to see, you know, uh, Gio to see the work you're doing and Marcus to see the work you're doing um, and, and others who are, who are just now coming up um, and, and look and say, okay, well, these are, these are folks who are attuned to the historical narratives, like they understand where we're coming from, but their perspective is organically aligned with the stuff that I'm describing. Whereas I feel like um, it wasn't always that way with, uh, with the, the critics and journalists you know, of a previous generation. And I think, you know, with with what with Gio intimated earlier too, I mean, I, I think he actually put it perfectly because, you know, that's also the process for the musicians, right? Is to when you speak about the differences between, you know, how we perceive things things and, and listening. And, you know, to me, you know, listening carries with it, you know, this energy of trying to actually understand, right? And an openness that doesn't really exist when we're looking at things. You know, sometimes when, I, when I'm dealing with children, you know, I grew up in, you know, an environment where my grandmother and mother owned nurseries. And, you know, we would always tell the kids when they were interacting with each other, not to think with their eyes, right? And so when, when you speak about the utility and listening, I think that's really all of the things that we're talking about, whether or not we're talking about what's going on in terms of uh, the, the larger culture, in terms of what's happening politically in this country, what's happening socially, you know, or if we're talking interculturally, most of the issues and impediments that we have are usually a byproduct of us not listening to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, when you said earlier, you know, you don't know that you'll ever be able to get to that space, to me as a musician and a, and a practitioner, if I'm working with a, a student or working with someone that's coming up, if they intimate what you just intimated, you know, and also Nate, when you speak about Sonny Rollins being in a space where he can't even accept that fully because he knows he has work to do, that idea of listening and evaluating and processing all of those things is, is exactly what is required to actually get to the next level. And ultimately, like we all, are in a process of growing, you know, like we all have relationships, Gio, you and I have known each other for quite yeah. a while and our relationship has grown a lot, you know? Yeah. And so the, the, the point is, is that that doesn't happen if we don't take a, the moment and time to actually process where, we, where each of us is in that moment, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, I just wanna make sure that, you know, I, I'm saying that too, because I know a lot of times it feels like the musicians are kind of like, beating up on the writers, you know, about, you know, well, but what about this? And you only talked about that. And, and I'm not doing all of these things. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's everyone is in a process of growing. Even the 94 year old person that's maybe writing an expose for Downbeat magazine, you know, that wrote about Louis Armstrong at one point, that person is also still in a space of growing. And I think if we relate to each other in those terms and in those ways, then this is this is the thing that helps us move forward and to heal in a moment that is so taxing and so difficult is tapping into that energy. So, you know, I applaud you guys for what you're intimating because that's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Perceive that. And that, I'm sorry, Gio, do you want to jump in or? No, I mean, Christian's absolutely right that I, through, through even just our interactions throughout the years, which have, you know, 
you know, been, uh, they've just been a space of learning for me. And I think that I've been, I've been grateful for that. And he's been able to share things that have, have really helped me sort of self-evaluate in a lot of ways as a writer. Um, and, you know, there's sometimes even collateral damage. And that's why I think you guys do beat up on us writers because you realize that the words <laughs> have power, you know, and, and, and that's why, you know, as a writer, I'm sure Nate and Marcus, you guys relate to this. You beat yourself up over words that come out because you, stare him in the face and you're like oh god really <laughs> oh man <laughs> let that one just like hang out there you know um and now it's not coming back like <laughs> I, I let it out and there it is but uh but i appreciate that because you know it is it's it's a process of uh that that wouldn't happen without the generosity honestly of these artists like yourselves who are actually willing to put yourselves in that vulnerable position of, of having words thrown at and onto the stuff that you're creating you know so. Yeah, and just to uh, switch gears a little bit, um, obviously we're talking about, you know, protest music and conveying peace and, and all of this stuff in the music. I guess my next question is more of a broad one, but I think it has, you know, several parts to it. How do you, I've been wrestling, I've been wrestling with this idea of spiritual jazz, right? Where, you know, when you hear certain music, at least for me as a writer, if I hear like an Alex Cold Train or something, somebody like that, I'm trained to think maybe through old criticism that, oh, this is a spiritual jazz record. But then I can't, now I'm thinking, I'm like, well, isn't jazz in and of itself a spiritual art form? You know what I mean? So it's like, what is the difference? So I guess, you know, I say all that to say, can, can spiritual jazz be protest music as well? If we can riff on that for a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think all of the music is, you know, energetically sort of tethered to that idea right because the the cultural spaces that the music comes from are spaces where they are you know the, the history has been the history so I, I don't think it's it for me i don't like to separate and make those types of distinctions when i'm speaking and dealing with music and i, I know like one of the things that nubai intimated you spoke about like your history in the caribbean right and obviously, like for me as a New Orleanian person, we have a Caribbean history as well, but also the root of the music starts in that environment. And part of what you learn as you're learning and you know, you're younger and you're developing, you're auditing these spaces. But one of the things that you're learning on your process in the, during the process of becoming initiated in this music is that it is all tethered and rooted in your spirituality, right? So those aren't things that maybe make it to like Cleveland, Ohio, or different spaces in terms of like what's being taught in jazz education, right? In universities and high schools. And, and this is something I go all over the world saying this because it becomes about the intention and what it is that you're doing. Like when I'm a little boy, I learned that jazz and blues are synonyms for each other, right? And the old people would always say that, that jazz was just blues that learned to speak all languages, right? And a huge component of that when we're speaking of blues music, jazz music, all of that, is also about you as a as a as a means of you know sort of cathartically releasing things, also having to be fully human, which also acknowledges spirit, right? And so when you're when you're younger and you're growing up in those environments and people are teaching you that at a, a very young age, you also understand why it's paramountly important to make sure that those principles in the music always stay around, right? Because sorry, for me. When I'm 13, 14 years old in these spaces and my teachers are talking about um, conjuring music and they're talking about the energy and the intention behind a note. So when I play a note, whenever I'm playing a note, I've already thought to myself what the intention is behind that note. When you spoke earlier, you talked about my trumpet sound and for, for you that being something that's captivating, but part of that is also tethered to being a person that came up as a 12 and 13 year old person, basically being told, don't play that note without your spirit in it. Don't say that without being fully connected to what it is that you're actually trying to say, because people will be able to feel that. People will be able to sense that. And so, you know, when we speak about the histories of this music, you can't divorce that. You can't divorce what you're hearing in this context from those, also those religions and those traditions that, that predate jazz. And what I mean by that is, is like when you speak about 
Candomblé music, when you speak about Santeria, loud traditions, all of these spaces, the music is essentially conjuring music and jazz is the same thing. The only difference I think on a general level is that the musicians in New Orleans were also very intentional about making sure that what they were doing was also tethered to them reclaiming something that had been taken away. And that's also a huge component of this that I think gets left out when we speak about creative improvised music, which is the core music is actually also designed to reclaim things from the past and to bring those things and to try and approximate the things that were taken away from you. So, so when you're speaking about spiritual jazz versus, I guess, uh, straight ahead jazz or other forms of jazz, the one element to me that cannot be taken out of this music, and that doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're making it with blonde hair or blue eyes or curly hair and brown eyes, is that the intention should always come from spirit first. So to me, there is no jazz without spirit. So, to, so the, the, the distinction has always been confusing to me because that's what the music is primarily. I, yeah, I have to jump on that, if you don't mind. Um, Mark, is, is that all right if I... Yeah, just real quick that I wanted to yeah. ask Nabaya. Yeah. Um, so my, I, I, all kinds of things are sparking as you're talking, Christian. And, and one of them, if, if, you, if, if I can just get personal for a second, um, I grew up in, in Hawaii. Uh, and so I had a lot of uh, contact with Hawaiian culture, Native Hawaiian culture, um, which is very spirit oriented. Um, you know, it's it's an indigenous people and they were they were a big part of, of the entire you know, social fabric in Hawaii. And so I grew up with that in the islands. And then I made the decision, like, all right, I need to I need to move east. I'm going to plug into this jazz scene. I'm going to go to, you know, I went to Philadelphia first and I went to New York and I felt like, all right, well, and that's that's over there. That's that thing and then this is this thing and to me jazz was visceral and cerebral and it what and the, the spiritual element was not really factored in and actually it was going to new orleans was one of the one of the things that helped me put the pieces together because the first time i went to new orleans i was like why does it feel so familiar here like why do i feel so why? At, at home you know what i mean and it reminded me of my of my home and and a lot of that had to do with the expression that you're talking about this 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 idea that spirit is sort of is fundamental it's integral it's everywhere um and also the idea of a reclamation which is i think you know when you talk about new orleans and and a place like honolulu that that's the thing that they have in common too is that the culture has been commodified and it is actually the the primary driver of the economy in a lot of ways is right. the commodification of the culture right right same in new um, orleans yeah. yeah so um it it was actually a process for me of of reconstituting that spiritual identity in the music and re, and sort of resituating it you know and saying like oh it's actually it's not just um pharaoh sanders when he's doing his thing that 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 means spiritual jazz. So I'm agreeing with with Christian that, it, like, ideally this is it, it is everywhere. Now, as Geo as Geo knows, um, having reviewed some some shows, I mean, there there are nights when when you're sitting in a club and there is no spirit in the room, <laughs> and it is and and maybe the the technical accomplishment is very high and and maybe some cool things are happening, but it's not the, the spirit is not there. And so you know um, that happens too. But I, I just, um, something about the way that you were expressing yourself, Christian, just, it, it, it really struck a chord with me because, because I had to make that journey. I had to sort of find my way back to it in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nabai, if you uh, wanted to jump in on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, what you're saying, Christian, definitely resonated with me in the way that, to me, Every, like I've definitely seen the term and heard the term kind of thrown around spiritual jazz and all of this and and even in a couple of bands that I'm a part of like oh this is what they play and and kind of in a way to well it's usually to like sell it isn't it you know it's always to sell the ticket like this is what you should expect and this is why you should buy the ticket because you're a fan of this type of music rather than the whole like music as a whole um but that's you know part of the other conversation about labeling everything um but for me I think playing music has always been about playing it with my whole self with my whole spirit with my soul um and in various institutions it 
hasn't been at the forefront and I think those are the times that I've like lost myself in terms of why I choose to play this music and why why I didn't even choose to play the music it fully as cheesy as it sounds like it fully chooses you I think when you choose to like let it in all of it um and give yourself to it each and every time you play um you're just a I feel like an instrument in that way rather than like putting my ego at the forefront of it like this is it's all about me it's it should be about like you said Christian what's your intent um doing this album this time round obviously we can't play it so the intent is like very difficult for me to deal with when I'm just talking about it because I don't have the balance of like every night I get to share the intention I get to share the feeling I don't even have to talk about the tunes if I don't want to I just get to play but without that um it really it really showed me the importance of displaying my spirit within the music through the way that I have to talk about it now because that's all I'm doing (laughs) um but rather than playing it but I do feel I feel so much more important around the story of the music, around the intention of the music, around explaining the spirit if I can't play it to you, Um, explaining how important the intention is behind this album and each story within the album and the narrative as a whole, because that's, that's how I'm communicating at the moment. Everybody has the record, obviously, and you can go and listen to a record and feel it without me describing what it is about or without someone analyzing it for you. And that is the spirit of the music. And you can have that, I can't remember uh, who said it, but someone just said, you know, when you go somewhere else and you feel like you're at home. That's how I felt when I went to Brazil, when I went back to the Caribbean for the first time and I'd never been there before. I was like 11 and I was like, how have I, I've been here before, but I don't know how. Um, in Colombia, in all over the world, you don't even speak the same language with words, but you can play with anyone. If you are truly listening, if you're truly present, if you truly intend to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Um, yeah, so that's my take on it. I think it's a, it's a huge important part of it that does get left out often. And I think I'm truly learning the importance of um talking about that side of it as well as I'm a musician and this is what I do and here's my album it's like I'm trying to communicate that side of things more um if I can't do that through the music that I play each gig I'm trying to do that with the intention behind the music and where the music has come from um which is my soul and my spirit, which is also my ancestors' souls and my ancestors' spirit and all the music that I've absorbed in all kinds of genres for my whole life. Okay. Well, um, it looks like this time flew away on us, so I've got time for one more question. I really appreciate y'all for taking the time, seriously. Um, I know, it went by real fast, right? (laughs) Uh, <laughs> really quick. Hours fast, yeah. Seriously, <laughs> we're, we're taking a fifteen-minute break and then uh, right. the second set. Part two, get you know, go get a bag lunch, get a bag lunch and come back. <laughs> but uh, but no, I just had one more question, and this is for everybody. I mean, because I, I feel like we all, you know, we all engage in creativity. You know, whether it's creative writing, obviously music. How do you how do you extract peace in such a turbulent landscape? You know, it's something I've been struggling with. So I'm curious to know how how we're all doing it. And Gio, if you could start that off, that'd be great. Oh, man. Give me the heart. I know, right? Uh, (laughs) Peace in 2020? Like, are you serious? Okay. Uh, (laughs) Let's see. Um, Just to piggyback a little bit off of what was being said before. And uh, I mean, just so much. But I mean, I was just, I just had the ghosts of October. Octavia Butler and and Mary Baraka sort of swimming together, thinking about change, the the, the, the Butler notion that God is change, and and what Mary Baraka said in the Changing Same, um, as you, I'm sure a lot of us here are familiar, but especially you, Nate, I think you've you've cited it, his notion that 
there is spirituality in, in all black music because um, the impulse is to do is to do new and to do change and to make sound out of that. Um, and that that's as much a spiritual work as, as you can really even imagine. So I love the idea that we were sort of talking about breaking down that dichotomy um, between uh, spiritual jazz and non-spiritual. Um, and I think there's a reservoir there in terms of like the way that that has been part of the music survival really. Um, and I think now, I mean, the joy is, is that when everything is so hard, um, that the work of, of, of getting inside this music and learning from this music is, is joyful work. You know, like it can feel like a place where it didn't get any simpler, it didn't get any easier this year, but it's also so rich and, and so full of information. And especially now that we've got a world around us that at least feels more compelled to entertain some of these really hard questions and to do more listening, I think this music uh, is a really crucial place to start from a broad standpoint. And then more specifically, I guess, um, especially over the summer and into the early fall, uh, I alluded to it earlier, um, just to go outside and to hear music so much in my neighborhood or places around me in New York, um, it's been refreshing because one thing I would have, I, I, if we had more time, I wanted to hear Christian respond to Nubaya's point about talking about the music versus playing it. Because Christian, I've always loved how that, that exchange that and that balance between talking about where, where the music comes from and then delivering it to people unfiltered, unfettered and direct has always been really, really bound up for you in your, in your extremely powerful stage performances. Um, and now I think is a, is a time to remind ourselves of the importance of the live act and the importance of the local. I mean, you had people at the beginning of quarantine talking about, can we go to church on Zoom, right? And people were doing that, but they were like, man, it's just not the same. <laughs> like, and it's the same with music. And maybe we can remind ourselves that we've been listening to records trying to scratch out of that surface something that we can't necessarily get unless we're in communion together. So as things return or whatever, or as we envision a new model for, for everything, hopefully, um, maybe there can be more emphasis on the local, there can be more emphasis on the in-person, there can be less emphasis on the kinds of commodification that are required, as you mentioned, Nubaya, when you're trying to mass produce and mass sell uh, a musical uh, offering. And there can be more focus on how much can be gained in this direct communion of whatever it is, the local scene around you, the, the place that, that, that you live in, you know, um, I think that's where a lot of this growth can be done. And for me, it's been a joyful experience amidst all of this to, uh, to see so much local music making occurring again. Okay. Well, I think uh, I think we got to leave it there. I'm looking at my time. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. It. Look at me going on and on. No, 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 no. You all were great, man. You all were great. So, no, I I really appreciate it. Seriously, this was a really good talk, and and it's good to it's good to talk to people who have the spirit and the music, and they're they're trying to convey something very real through the writing and the music. And like I said at the top, I'm a legit fan of everybody on this call. So, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for bringing Thank us you. together. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Bro. Thank you so Good much. To see you guys, man. Thank you all, too. I know. You too. <laughs> Thank you, too. All right. Thank yes. Thank you so you well. Yeah. As a part of our partnership with the Newport Jazz Festival, High Snobiety Jazz TV is raising money for the Newport Festival's Foundation Musician Relief Fund which provides financial support to members of the jazz and folks communities who are experiencing a loss of income as a result of COVID-19. Support the cause by going to the URL below. What's up, y'all? Christian McBride here. Welcome to my man cave. <laughs> I never stopped listening to vinyl, even around 1990, 1991, when vinyl kind of, you know, kind of went out and CDs became the norm. I always stuck with my vinyl because it sounds better. That's that's what I think. You know, basically, uh, 
This is all cataloged alphabetically. We start at uh, Canon Mo Adderley and, you know, all the way to Zawido. <laughs> uh, all this is James Brown and James Brown Productions. That's Coltrane, all the impulse stuff here. I got three copies of Tutu here. Uh, this is the Tutu Deluxe that I got not that long ago. Whichever copy is more scratched up, that's the one I bought in high school. The Jacksons down here. Got some Michael and, and his brothers mixed in down there. Ah, the uh, Eminon, Wayne Shorter project. This is, this is amazing. Anything Wayne Shorter does is just, you know, gets me right here. Now here's something for you. This is a really good copy of the first Miles Davis record that uh, I probably fell in love with. I want to play you this record because this has become like an earworm for me in, in the last year and a half. Now, let's see. I think I was listening to the soundtrack from the movie Soul to Soul. Y'all hip to that one? Uh, it was made in Ghana, 1971. In fact, let's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play a little bit of that since that's what was on here. Listen to Ike and Tina Turner. Boy, oh, they cutting it up. Wait, I'm gonna run it up. No, just to the African drummers, but let's get to I can see them when they come in with the, with the soul. Tina Turner, boy, she's so bad. Now to close you out, be a little Fire Eater by Rusty Bryant. And yes, I have all my PlayStation stuff here too. But Idris Muhammad on the drums. Bill Mason on the organ and Wilbur Longmire on the guitar. That's all I'm going to give for now. So there's a little, a little taste of my man cave. And we'll see you again very soon. Is your ex's boyfriend wearing your hoodie? Are you hoodie-less? Are you wearing a crew neck? You should probably get a new one. Just to let you know, a portion of the proceeds are going to Newport's COVID Relief Fund to help out jazz musicians and folk musicians during these tough times. Hey everybody, what's up? Christian McBride here. I'm bassist and artistic director of the Newport Jazz Festival. And it is a honor to have you all here on High Snobiety. We are raising awareness for the Newport Foundation Musician Relief Fund. And uh, to help me do that, uh, i like to introduce all of you to someone that you all know. Uh, you know him well, he's a, he's, he's a legend. Uh, one of the movers and shakers of the music today, my man, the great Robert Glasper. What That's I'll the do. best introduction I ever had. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, no, hey, man. <laughs> you the cat. You the cat. Appreciate you having me on. This is dope. Absolutely, sure. man. So uh, right how's up. everything out there in uh, in La La Land? Whew. Everything's cool, man. It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting time. I don't think I've, in 20 years, I've never sat still this long. Yeah, you know what I mean? Right. I've right. never sat... I mean, I don't think even longer than that, but especially when I got to New York, I got to New York, what, 90, I don't know, 98, something like that, 97, 98. Yeah. And since 1999, I've been on tour every year. You know what I mean? Like with somebody doing something, you know? And so right. this is an interesting time having to sit still and really take a look at everything. And it, it's a it's a good time too. You know, I, I uh, was able to, I'm, as you can see, I'm, I'm in my studio, I build a studio, uh, me and Terrence Martin, Build, build, build a studio yes. and yeah. uh we're getting we're getting it together now but it's uh having me focus on that and 
getting better at recording. You know, I feel like if you're if, if you're in the pandemic, you should come out of it being doing something gotta, better than you did before. Man, listen, <laughs> I, I've been uh, I've been getting I've been getting some shared time in because I thought if I'm not a better bass player after this is over, this was all a waste. Now I don't even understand what that would sound like, Christian. I'm scared. To, I don't even know what that means. You be a better bass player. You might as well just start playing saxophone or something like that. You, you got to get better at another instrument. <laughs> No, for sure. I, I yeah. hear myself play sometimes. I'm just like, ugh. Right. Oh, it's like if God. you come out of for all the jazz cast, if you come out of this pandemic still sounding like you did on the bridge of all the things you are before the pandemic, <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Man, but you know, I, I see you and Terrace and Jahi on, on the I see your Instagram story. <laughs> so I know y'all, y'all not letting this keep your creativity oh. down. Oh you no, know? man! I've been putting out. I've been putting out stuff. Me and Terrace have a a, a group called Dinner Party, yep. um, and it's with Kamasi Washington and, and producer Knife Wonder. We put a record out maybe two months ago, and then we just put a remix record of that record out last uh, maybe uh, October 9th. It came out. It's called Desserts. Yeah, Go and ahead. we put a remix. Of, uh, so you know, we're just kind of trying to keep it moving, man. And and you know, I've been doing some scoring, some more film scoring, and trying to get into getting into that more, and trying to get that muscle going while I'm while I'm here. You know. Now, did you did you start your own label, record label? No, no, I didn't start my own label. Terrace has his own label. Right, right. I, I, I haven't started my own record label. That's something I definitely want to do. I just have, I have to find the right time and the right place to do it in and and make it work. Right. But that's definitely something I, I, I want to do. I'm working on I'm working on a new album now, um, Black Radio 3. So I have yeah. these two records, Black Radio 1, Black Radio 2. So now I'm in a yeah. mission to Black Radio 3, which is interesting because now I'm having to do it just by sending files to everybody versus being in the room, versus being in the studio, you know, and that's yeah, a different it's, thing. It's, it's so wild, man. Like the last three albums I've played on were just like sitting down and putting bass tracks down. Yeah, you know? yeah. Wow, it's different. Very different, you know what I mean? And I, you know, for R&B and hip hop and stuff like that, you can get away with it more because it's less interaction all the time. Right. You know what I right. mean? So you can get away with it. It's just laying a track like you do in any way. But sometimes that magic of being in the room with the person and, you know, coming up with ideas or even hearing them tune up. I get ideas from hearing people tune up. What was that you played? No, that's right. a joint. Let's put that, right. you know, right. just right. all those right. little right. things. You miss all yeah. those little snacks, those little bitty, mm, you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> but, but at the same time, I, I I know a lot of artists who have gotten good at home recording, their yeah, vocals, yeah. And, and now they're, you know, you get to, you, you now you can, you know, you can, you know, record with more more opportunity to record with more people and more often, yeah. and because you don't yeah. have to be in the room, you don't have to pay for flights and hotels and. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't show up and you know that's all right, that stuff. That's right, that's right. I mean, I gotta tell you what's so what's so cool, man, is I um in fact it, it drops tomorrow. Uh tomorrow being Friday, October twenty-third. Um I'm on Bootsy's new album. And oh! uh, yeah. Are you and, serious? Yeah, yeah, man. That was a dream come true, man. Of course. And, and so you talk about like hearing cats, you know, you get ideas from cats tuning up. Yeah. And so uh, Bootsy, he played the track and right. I'm playing along with it. And I'm right. literally just, like trying to find out what the, I'm trying to, to figure out what to play. Right. And so I, I'm, I'm just playing this old mess, you know, just kind of messing around. Bootsy was like, right. uh, yeah, baby, do that. And I was like, no, you don't want that. Really? I was just messing around. Right, He's right, like, right. no, that's what I want, baby. Put some more of that mess around on there. <laughs> <laughs> you sound just like him. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, baby. Uh, uh, yeah, baby, put some of that mess around on it. <laughs> I love it. Mess around. Mess around. That's right. So, uh, Wasn't there a song yeah. called Mess Around back in the day? Do the mess around. Ray, 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 Charles. Ray, Ray, Ray Charles. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> man, look, of course. You know, one thing I love talking to you about, man, and Jason Moran and uh, Chris Dave and Eric Harlan, you know where I'm going. Yeah. Yep. Uh, eight down. Yeah, uh, yep. I find it so weird that um, how is it that Houston has produced such? I mean, it, like, like all these bad cats come out of Houston, man. But like, yep. there's nowhere to play in Houston. There's no scene. There's no scene at all. 
How'd y'all do that? It's like it's like being in it's like being in the desert, but we have the best swimmers come out the desert. Like what? Yeah, exactly. Well, y'all got right. no pool. How y'all swimming? That's because <laughs> that's, exactly, you know what? that's a great analogy. It's literally because of our high school, uh, the high school for, for performing and visual arts. That's the only place where the scene is like that. It was the school, it's a, a, you know, a, the arts high school. Like y'all, y'all have one in Philly. You went to the one in Philly with Questlove right. and. I think Bilal and a few uh, boys to men went there too. Yep. Yeah, y'all got a y'all got a super rich history. Ours ain't that deep. No one did it, Francisco. Yeah, y'all, yeah, y'all got that super deep. Our stuff is cool, but <laughs> but you know, our our stuff started getting dope. Like, yeah, in the nineties, you know what I mean. In the nineties, they know we started doing it. And and Beyonce, I went to school. With Beyonce there. Um, Brian Michael Cott, Walter Smith, saxophone player. Oh, Mike Moreno. Oh, Guitar player, Kendrick Scott, you know what I mean? Um, Mark Kelly, that plays with the Roots right now. You know, yes. it was literally our high school, uh, shout out to Dr. Morgan, Dr. Bob Morgan. Our high school, um, I believe, is the only high school in the country that allowed teachers to teach who didn't have a degree. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. So, our, our, our teachers in our in our in our in our uh, piano lab, and our and our jazz combo was just cats around the city on the scene, right, right on the scene playing on the scene right now in that time period. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they knew the cool. Because a lot of times with, with with colleges and stuff like that, sometimes you get the teachers who never made it, who can't really play, or you know they they don't they don't know the hip. You know it's kind of like ah. Right. You know, right, but then right. you get the cats who actually can't play, who've been on the records, who've been around the cats, who can really teach you something. And it's cool to have cats who are actually who were actually in the scene that could teach us the hip stuff of 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 that time period. You know what I mean? And a lot of a lot of those cats, a lot of the baddest cats didn't go to school or couldn't finish school because they yeah, had to who, get out of school. Who was who was probably uh, your biggest mentor growing up in in Houston? Uh, my biggest mentor is a cat nobody knows. His name was Alan Mosley. Alan mm. Mosley. He was Tell so my mother, him. my mother was a piano player. My mother was a singer and slash piano player. She she, she accompanied herself some a lot of the times, but she had a lot of bands and Alan was her piano player in a lot of her bands. So oh, when they were rehearsed and we used to wear, have the rehearsals at the house. My mom, we had drums, keyboards, everything, amps at the house. So they would mm. come over and rehearse and I used to just sit by Alan and watch him play. And he would show me little things after he finished playing. And the reason why I got into the high school performing arts, I didn't know any jazz tunes. I just knew gospel songs. I played in church. He mm -hmm. taught me how to play a jazz version of Spider-Man, <laughs> a, 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 a minor blues, C minor blues version right, of, ooh, right. doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, with the walking bass line. You know what right. I mean? That was the jazz song I played. Other than that, I played three church songs <laughs> and I got <laughs> into the school. You know, I, I got into the school, but yeah, um, it, it was that guy, uh, Alan Mosley. Yeah. Now, how did so so like, you get to high school, you know these you know these gospel songs, you know this one jazz tune. When did the jazz thing start opening up? The, the jazz thing opened up with the other students. So when I got to the school, it was the the people I was around most mostly like Eric Harlan and Chris David, the guy they had already graduated. Jason Moran. They already right. graduated. They they their their spirit was still there. Everybody was like, "You could be the next Jason Moran if you keep it keep it up." You know, his picture was on in the jazz room, and he, there was a Jason <laughs> Moran found foundation. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I had a lot of I was big shoes to fill. We used to do a record every year. The our high school was just to do an album every year, and so really? I used to listen to the album, the last album with Jason Moran on it, and it, and man. Oh, and I used to listen to that all the time. And I used to want to be Jason, like, oh my God. And when he came back to the school, I met him. I was like, ah, you know, he gave me a little lesson in the practice room and stuff, you know, so, so, but um, it was the students, man. My, Mike Moreno, a bad guitar player, man. He, he's the one, he, he was the rich guy in the school. He had, he had <laughs> CDs before anybody else. So <laughs> he had a CD player, a CD for anybody else. So. We had a class on so another thing that was good about the school was we had a listening class. A course where you go yes. in and you just listen you don't play. You sit around a speaker. We used to roll in with a CD player, the tape player, and everybody could bring in something and you just listen for the whole the whole period. 
And I think wow. that's important. I think most people need that. A lot of cats don't even know what to listen to. You know yeah. what I mean? You're not even yeah. aware of what you should be listening to to get inspired. You know what I mean? And yeah, we had that's a, right. Mike Moreno used to bring in all the hip stuff. I remember when he brought in Getting To It, your record. Uh, we sat around there and listened to Getting get, get To It with Shannon to See The Tree. And, and, oh. the, and we learned, man, look, we charted out all them joints. We did Shannon to See The Tree. We did, uh, in a hurry. In a hurry. We 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 made big bang arrangements out of those days. We played them in our oh, combo man. class. Man, what? Yo, what? Are you serious? Are you kidding me? Like for real? So that was such an important important time because, like I said, all the students were so into it. It's very rare to find another like fifteen year old kid who loves jazz. You know what right. I mean? That's not that's not normal. And it was the school was full of that. You know what I mean? So you know what's cool about. You know, your story sounds uh, quite similar to what it was like when I got to Kappa in, in, in mm -hmm. high school, because as you all know, my oldest friend in music is Joey DeFrancesco. Right. And yep. uh, Joey is one of these kids that, uh, I mean, he was gigging around Philly when he was like eight. You know, right? Yeah, right. Like, right. It's, it's, you know, you know, what gets very difficult is like, you know, being involved in jazz education. You know, what always happens is you'll, you'll meet a kid, you know, nine, 10, 11 years old, who's really a prodigy. They, they, play, right. they play the instrument really well. And the question always comes up, you know, I, I, I get it, parents are proud and they should be, they should love everything they're seeing. But right. then the parent right. says, oh my God, have you ever heard anybody so good, so young? <laughs> I can't tell them the truth. <laughs> you know, I knew Joey DeFrancesco. He was exactly. gigging at age eight. You know, right. so I'm not right. trying to right. say right. your kid doesn't impress me. I will right. tell you that they do, but right. I got to right. tell you, Joey it's D. Francesco, he kind of ruined it for, for, for me, you know? Exactly. So, uh, exactly. you know, so like, I meet Joey and I'm 12, he's 13, and he's already a local superstar, right? Right, and, right. Uh, and then we get to Kappa, and then most of the cats in that school that could play are, are people who never, you know, some of them didn't really turn out to be professionals, you know? Right. And like, I'm getting to school and they, you know, here they are, they talking about Coltrane and Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers and Rasan, Roland Kirk. And my head is just right. spinning like, oh man, I right. can't get enough of this. And I met right. a guy named, uh, you may know him. Um, do you know Byron Landham, you know Byron yeah. Landham, don't you? I used to. Cool. I was on tour. I was on tour of Byron Landham for years with Russell Malone. Yes, there you. Of course, that's right. That's right. Yep. So yep. Byron and his older brother Robert, uh -huh. those were like my two number one. You know, they, those those were like my dudes. So, wow. Uh, Robert, Robert, and Byron were like, look, I don't know what you're learning in school, but come right. over to our house and we gonna share it on the real stuff. So they pull out right. like those BSOP albums, um, uh. Maiden Voyage. Uh, yeah. The real McCoy, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Power to the People, Joe Henderson, all the stuff. And uh, you know, we Robert be like, so let me show you what to play on on a Lydian chord. Let me show you what right. to play on a, on a sharp nine chord. And I just be like, wow, this is better than right. school. <laughs> right, of course, exactly, exactly. And, and these That's cats crazy. That, yeah, these cats weren't that much older than me, man. And yep. uh, they showing me the stuff, you know. I just played do I just played with Joey. I, I did uh, we did a I did a gig uh, uh this um I'm one of the curators for this cruise ship, the, the Blue Note Jazz Cruise. Sure. And yes. Joey was a Joey was a guest on the cruise and uh, I had him sit in with my trio on organ. Oh and we got man. The, we got a chance to play together. But then I didn't out of nowhere, we're at the sound check, I hear a tenor sax. And I'm like Who's killing on tenor sax? Kamasi? No, it's not. Kamasi's not here. It's Joey on tenor. I knew he played trumpet. I didn't know he played saxophone too, bro. So let me tell you something. I, when I saw him play the saxophone, I told him, I said, look, man, you know you're my brother. I love you more than anyone on this on this planet. But if you ever pick up the <laughs> your life is going to end. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Exactly. It's like, yo, are you serious, bro? Are, Nicholas Payton's like that too. One of them guys yes. too. Yes, he's like that. that. Warren Wolf is like that. Warren Wolf. Yeah. It's like, yo, what are y'all doing? <laughs> I hate. I hate all of you. I love you, but I hate all of you. you can't stand them. Like, let, let, <laughs> we should make like an MTV. What, you remember they used to have those MTV celebrity death match? 
those, those yes. claymation joints. Oh man, they should do that with jazz for sure. One hundred percent. That would be amazing. Or Wolf versus amazing. Nicholas Payton. Boy, I, I I'd buy some popcorn for that one. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but you know, one of my one of my favorite stories, you know, we we've talked about this many, many times is uh mm. man, the first time you and I had a chance to play together. Mm -hmm. um, meeting you was such a uh, it was such a beautiful thing, man, because like you came out of nowhere. You know, Shedrick introduced us. Yeah, Shedrick Mitchell. That's right. You played you played so good, man. I remember thinking, you know, there's a general rule that if you need to send somebody in as a sub, yeah. you don't send in someone who could potentially take your gig. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> You send in right. somebody who no, you know, they can, who can do the gig. Them. Right. They, do they the can gig. cover That's it. Right. Right, right, That's right, right. right. <laughs> and then when I heard you play, I was like, right. <laughs> mm, I like this Glasper dude, you know. Right, 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 right. That was fun. Yeah, I yeah, I'll never forget that. That was me, you, uh, Rodney Green. Yep. Green and yep. Uh, Tim, what, Tim. No, was it Tim Warfield? Yeah. Yeah, Tim Warfield. Yeah, Tim Warfield yep, exactly. and, and Keith Loftus made a few gigs with us. Keith, that's right, that's right. Yeah. And a uh, uh, saxophone player from from Barbados, not Barbados, from the uh, Ron was, Blake. Ron Blake, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Look, yeah. I'll never forget when the first time we played. I think our first gig might have been Ortleaves. I think you put, brought me there first, <laughs> just to right. get me, you know, acclimated, you know, the thing. And you, you called know, off. I actually think that you know what's funny. That gig was actually. I think that might have been Tim's gig, but he just kept the band together. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, because yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I remember. I, I look. Like, I, I said, just get Robert. You know, I, I'll never forget when you counted off Roland Dervish. I was like, what? Because it's normally like you said, ready, Roland Dervish. What? What? <laughs> My left hand couldn't move fast enough. I was like, oh Jesus, uh, help me, Lord. I think I'm gonna make it through this. <laughs> you gonna make it through this? Hey, That's so funny. That's right. Killed it. That's right. And all the gigs, I I, I I say it all the time. A every gig, you have to call my mom after the gig and make sure yes. so she'll make sure I got back to the hotel okay after each I show. I loved it. That's right. And I, I love speaking with her, man. He, I, right. I went, he, he was like, hey, hey, Christian, can you come by my room? You got to talk to my mom. I was like, yep. yeah, all right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So she's like, "Is my baby okay?" I was like, "Yes, ma'am. He's 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 totally cool." <laughs> Man, and uh, for sure. One one great thing about being a uh, you know when you're a sensitive musician and you're a skilled musician, you know, you, there's a certain level of a, you you got to listen. You got to you got to yep. you got to be alert. You got to listen. You got to see what's going on. Uh, yep. One of my favorites. There's another story about you that I love to tell. We were playing a gig in in Hartford, Connecticut, and um, it was a, it was kind of like a put together thing, and Lewis Nash was on drums. Nash, yeah, yeah, Lewis Nash was playing drums, and uh, Keith Loftus was playing tenor, and we had we were playing a song of my lull lullaby for a ladybug, and uh -huh. somewhere along the way, there was a major train wreck with Keith and <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think Keith had missed the first ending or whatever it was or right, something. Right, and right. We were all in like. And like a whirling most, dervish. <laughs> yeah, most things are recoverable, but that right. was one of the few times I remember thinking, I should probably just stop and start over again. And I remember, I remember looking at you on the piano, and it was, but it was so beautiful because you were looking at the music and you're like, looking at me, you like, right. <laughs> uh, McBride, what are we doing? Right, uh, right. What's happening? You know, and I remember <laughs> you, you, you bogarted something that got everybody back. Right. Back in play, you know? right, right, right. And it, it was, it was really that. That was that's one of my fondest memories of young Glasper, kind of knowing what to do to say, "Bam, here we are." Boom, boom. Exactly. You know? That's something. That's yeah. something I learned just by. Sometimes, I mean, all all of our as a, as musicians in general, all of our um, experiences make us better. I've played in so yes. many bad situations that. <laughs> I know how to, I can hear when something goes wrong and I've had to fix it before. You know what I yeah. mean? So it's like, okay, I know what to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, oh shit, okay, boom. Now, you know, it took us, 
it's it's a slap real I threw water on you, but now we're now we're alert. Now we know where we are. Now we know where we're going. That's now right. Now we know where we are. Because a lot of times with, with musicians too, man, a lot of spe- a lot of cats, especially if they're you know bad cats, don't listen. <laughs> Part of what makes you a bad cat is being able That's to awesome. listen and and yeah, and pay yep. attention to what's going on and how quick you can respond and. If, if you get lost, which you're going to get lost, there's no no musician on earth has not gotten lost, no matter how good really? you are. That That's doesn't right. exist. Matter of fact, the more, the better you are, the more chances you take, The my, you might get lost even more. You know what I mean? Just because you're taking those chances and, I mean, you know, you, you have to be able to, 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 to not have such an ego to where you don't listen and, and you can right. readjust. You know what I mean? I mean, I listened to Herbie Hancock tell stories about playing with Miles Davis. He said that that was some of the most fun. That was the f- most fun part of the tune. Often was getting lost. Yeah, he was like, right. "Hey man, where are we?" It's like I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll figure it out at some point. Somebody will Probably. give me a a marker, you know, or something. Right, right, but right. You know Matter of fact, like, Herbie told me, um, and they and I love it because they so they were so open too, and even on the recordings. I think isn't that something with a few things, but I've talked to him about Eye the Hurricane. Yeah. And like when they recorded it, somebody wasn't clear whether it was a minor blues or just F minor. Oh. It wasn't necessarily clear at first. And then it just became clear as they started playing. I forgot oh. who he said it was. It was either Ron or I forget who he said it was. Or or Fred, oh. I can't remember who it was. But he's like, then then it kind of became clear and they kept the take. You know, I'm just like, yeah. okay, here we go. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, well, you know, yeah. you know, on um on uh on the Sorcerer album, mm-hmm. the first song they played Prince of Darkness, and and I find this really this is this is beyond gutsy. On the first song of Prince of Darkness, yeah. If you notice, Miles gets turned around at some point, like like okay, Tony, I check it out Tony plays something really. Tony like derails Miles for a hot second. Right. Right. Miles gets on the other side of the beat. He right. eventually finds his way back. But I remember thinking right. like. That's the take they used. And yeah, I was yeah, like, wow. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah. that. Mistakes and all. <laughs> mistakes and all. It takes That's courage to make mistakes. It takes courage to make mistakes and, and to keep it there. You know what I mean? Like, it don't take no courage to be perfect. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like <that's, laughs> Herbie was the king of mistakes. He even told me, he was like, man, most of the songs, I, I, didn't, I, I ignored the changes. So those, the, you know, because he told me right before they did um, Miles Smiles, yeah. At the recording session, my boss came over to him and told him, hey, you know, try to not comp with your left hand. Right. And not try not to use your left hand. And Herbie didn't even know why. Miles didn't even tell him why. And right, he said right. Miles never told him why, but then he realized later. So on Miles Miles, which this, which might be my favorite Miles record because yeah. of that, that's when Herbie went into a whole new world of, of, of opening up harmony because that's he wasn't right. held back by his left hand. Right that's from right. that moment, it opened up everything. You know what I mean? There's, it's just that, there's, there's that one part on Dolores, I think, when they're playing yeah. the head out. Yeah. Like, he doesn't comp the whole tune. He just takes his, his right hand solo. Yeah. Yeah. There's one part where he just he just plays a chord just one time. Just and one time. Like, it goes just like, yeah. Oh, it's like, woo. 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 Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, woo. Man, That's tell me, right. Tell me, about, tell me about the first time you met Herbie. First time I met Herbie uh, in a real way where we actually had a conversation, I would say was was in China. My my band opened up for him and Chick. Mm. Uh, for him and Chick somewhere, was it China? It was somewhere, some somewhere in Asia. Mm. Um, and I came off, I came off stage. And Herbie, I saw Herbie walking like from the dressing rooms coming. I was like, oh, snap. Herbie's walking. I could really, because I've met him before in passing and, you know, stuff like that. But this is like, I'm going to have a real conversation with Herbie there. And, man, I stopped to talk to him. This might have been like, I don't know, 2000. It was kind of late in the game. It was like maybe 2015 or something like that. Really? 14. 14 as far as like really having like a rapidly. real thing with yeah. her because I can't remember the first time I met him, but the first time we had a real connection was that because he talked about the Pippa Butterfly album, the Kendrick Lamar album. Mm. He mm-hmm. talked about that record and that was like 2000, that was 2014, I believe. Wow. And he was like, man, what you guys did on that record, it was like an opera. I mean, we like, we literally talked for like 20 minutes. It's the longest conversation I had to that point with Herbie. 
And that's what we, and then he's like, man, I, I love that. I want to, I want to connect with you guys, you and Terrace and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, cool. So I, we, that's when we exchanged numbers. You know what I mean? I walked away with Herbie's number. I was like, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, you know, and then right out, not far after that, we did a Blue Note record, uh, and uh, like a Blue Note All Stars record with me, Ambrose. Oh yes, Mark that's Franklin, right. That's and the Herbie same group and, that's in the uh, in the documentary. Exactly, same group in the documentary, yeah. and Herbie and Wayne were special guests, so they came to the to the they, they played the session. When Herbie got to the session, I called Terrace. I was like, Yo, Terrace, Herbie's here at this session. Drop whatever you're doing. Come now. Get over here. Right, so you can right. meet Herbie. Because I told Terrence, I was like, yo, next time you do a Kendrick Lamar album after Good Kid, Mad City, I said, please, I got to be a part of it. So he called me like, yo, we're doing the Pippa Butterfly now. Come to the studio. And I ran, I got in the Uber, I got to, got there. You know what I mean? And that's why I'm on that album. So when it's time right. to, for him to meet Herbie, I was like, come now. He met Herbie and now he's producing the Herbie's record. You know what I mean? And it's, it's just so, it's so great that Herbie wants to be involved right. in, in this and, and, and you know he's he's never he's never that guy that's the legend that's like i've been there done that i'm done yeah right. you know what i mean he's still well, going what's, yeah what's that like for you because in a way i mean you know herbie hancock i mean it's really shocking to think that you know he's 80 years old he's 80. he's 80 right and but he's turning to a younger generation cats like like literally half his age and right. saying Show me. Yeah. What 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 do I do in, in a situation yeah. like this? Hook me up. So in what, a way, you're almost like a mentor to Herbie. What, what's exactly. that? What's that like? That's it. That's so crazy because like literally when I when I'm in LA and I do a show with someone, Herbie pulls up. Hey, what's happening? He pulls up to the show. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's it's so crazy. Right. Because right. when you think about it, Herbie did rock it when he was my age. Right. Herbie was 40, 41. When he did Rocket, that was the beginning of hip hop. He helped start a whole genre of music when he was forty. He could right. stop. He could stop at that point. You know what I mean? And now, right. you know what I'm saying? Now he's double the age, and still like, yo, what's new? What's the and then right. not too long ago, beat out Kanye West for album of the year at the Grammys. Come on, man. I mean, Kirby, man. And that's the thing. I think it's it's the mixture of both things. It's a mixture of his mastery, but it's also a mixture of the how human he is, and not I mean, he's, you know how human he can be. He's a mortal. He's a you know, but he's actually a person. You know what I mean? Right. It's hard to believe, right. but he knows he's a person. He's a, he told me he's a person first. Music is what he does, and he can always learn from anybody. You know what I mean? And that that just is so inspiring that somebody like that could have that thought process, and that's why he's still here and doing what he does, man. It's incredible. When did you realize that? Um... You, you know, you have been pretty much the best example I can think of, of a generation uh, of a musician inside the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's a lot of musicians who have, have who have, uh, you know, I, I say they, they, they break that glass ceiling, that, that sort of, mm -hmm. that glass ceiling of jazz. Um, yep. It happened to Esperanza Spalding, it's yep. happening with uh, Kamasi, um, it, it happened with Diana Krall in the late 90s, yep. but you, you have actually been someone that not only did you crack that grass that that glass ceiling, but you have like a whole space that you created this sort of jazz hip hop r and b space. A lot of people visit that a lot of people yeah. you know come in and out, but you've yeah. sort of like you know you're the cat that sort of created that thing at least that's how I feel. Like, when did you real? was that a conscious thing? Um, did it happen like by accident or like, how did you know that you were creating this, this whole, this whole other thing? The thing, yeah, right. So I you realized, know, it, I Will realized. Hargrove had a little bit with the RH Factor. Exactly, exactly. And I went on tour with RH Factor. So Roy Hargrove, of my generation, a little above, he was the one that I looked up to for that. He was the like when he came to he came to my high school. I never forget he came to my high school and did a show, and I'd never seen a young all black jazz band before. I think it was Hutch, you know, and right. I was like Ruben Rogers, somebody. It was like, and they all had on, you know, Roy had on 
jeans and sneakers and a right. cap. And then and I was like, I've never seen nobody look like me. Literally, you were, wait, we think we have the ahead. same shirt or something. And playing right. straight ahead and killing it. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. like, oh, you can still be of today, dress of today, be young, but still know the language and play the language. Because right. I always right. thought, I always thought, you know, you had to look like my principal to play jazz and that wasn't cool to me. You know what I mean? And that's what turns some kids off. It's like, you know, that's the, they look at that and it's like, ah, it's not cool. That right. stuff was cool in their day, but this is a different day. So it's like, I feel like I connect with my audience and I, I, I'm able to bring jazz into a new era because they look at me and they see themselves. You know what I mean? A lot of, a lot of times that's literally what it is. And so Roy, yeah, Roy was the first person I saw of my generation that was a straight ahead jazz musician that was playing with D'Angelo, mm -hmm. that was playing with The Roots, right. that put out an album with, you know, Q-Tip on it and Michelle and Diego Cello, you know, and it was like, it was cool stuff. You know, I was like, oh, you can do that. And then Roy took me on tour with him when I was still in college for the first RH Factor tour. Mm. And the first place we went to was Houston, Texas. So oh, very, is that the one where, uh, yeah. My mom, tell, tell my mom. <laughs> So I'm like, I don't know, I'm like maybe a junior in college or something. And we go to we go to Houston. I'm with Roy Hargrove going to Houston. I'm like, yo, I'm here. I'm in, right. I'm with Roy. I'm in Houston. The place is packed. It's killing. I'm like, woo. Yeah. Um, Spanky was on guitar too. Yes. Yep. I remember Spanky was on guitar. Uh, but Lil John, not Lil John, sorry. No, it was Willie Willie. Willie Jones and okay. uh uh I forget the yeah, a little bunch of okay, Red Reggie Washington. Anyway, we get there, right when the first song starts, we start playing the first song that I don't have a solo on. My mother walks into the building, walks straight up to the stage, points at Roy and says, give my baby a solo. <laughs> That's the greatest story ever. The whole greatest band story. like, oh, snap. And Roy was like, "You, I think I, he might have been soloing. I think he might have been in the middle of a... Whatever happened, he stopped and was like, you heard your mama. Go on. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I took a solo. I'll never forget that. But seeing Roy oh, do that, that was... you know, that, that inspired me to, to, to do that. So, like, literally in college, I started, I, I, I was, I met Bilal in college. Dope singer for Philly, you know. Yeah. And I met Bilal and me and him started writing songs. He ended up getting signed to Interscope Records and doing an album. I was working on his album. And then started going on tour with Bilal, like in 1999, going on tours, opening up for Erica and Common. So now I'm in that world, in the neo soul hip hop world. But at the same time, I'm on tour with you. Uh, right. You know, you took me. You took me on my first tour. I failed <laughs> classes because of Christian. Look, I was never at school. I was never at school. But that's what I went to New York for. I was like, sorry, that's what I'm here for. So we gonna figure <laughs> this out. But I'm on tour with you. We're a hard girl, Russell Malone. You know, Mark Whitfield, and I'm, I'm and so I. I never stopped being on tour with Bilal while I was doing the jazz stuff. And right. then from Bilal, you know, I started working with Common and Q-Tip and, and it just got more and more and working a lot with The Roots. And then I, I just started working, I started doing stuff with Jay Dilla, you know what I'm saying? And so I was literally in both worlds, you know, and I started yeah. playing with Maxwell. I played with Maxwell for five years, you know what I mean? And while we're on breaks on Maxwell tours, I would, I would do trio gigs. I would do gigs because my band, the Maxwell band was me, Derek Hodge and Chris Dave. And Shadrick wow. Mitchell, and Shadrick Mitchell wow. on Oregon. That was the band. So when we had days off, I had my people book us a gig and we'll play on the day off in that city. You know what I mean? So I just That's kept wow. it going. And yeah. I, I I feel what made me, put me in a certain space was, um, I feel like I played with the best of each genre. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people that, are jazz musicians, they want to play hip hop, but they never play hip hop with actual hip hop people. No, right. in real MCs, right. no real hip hop musicians. Cause there is a hip hop musician that's a real thing. You know what I'm saying? Like a hip hop bass player, that's a different thing than a regular bass right. player. Right. You know, right. you have to know right. the genre. And so if you want to be good at any other genre, you have to play with those people that play the genre. Don't play with other jazz musicians trying to play the genre. You're not going to get why, it. That's, that's why I really, I mean, I, I feel bad. Like, you listen to jazz albums from the late 60s of jazz cats trying to play funk. Yeah, like terrible. There's, there's a part of me that's like, oh, bless their hearts. 
but you need some cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you need the cats because they right. they end up playing. They end up playing at the genre. You know, at right. it. They play at it, right. and you right. can tell that's what right. they're good at. You can tell what they're really good at, what they're not, and that's why that's their right. crossover, their crossover appeal never works. You know what I mean? So I spent time playing with the best of the MCs. I spent time right. playing with the best of, you know, I played with Amir, Quest Love for years. Yep. You yep. know, he's the best hip hop drummer alive, really. You know what I'm saying? That he is. That he is. 100%, you know what I mean? And then I, on the ja and, and on the jazz front, I played with you. I played with Roy Hargrove. I played with Russell Malone. I play, I can list all the people I played with then. And the R&B &B front. Kenny Garrett. And Kenny Garrett. And, uh, you yeah. know, so many, and Terrence Blanchard, I, the list yep. goes on. So. Yeah. That's the thing. I was in those rooms with the real cats that did it. So I learned how to really do it. And I respect each genre. And I think that's why I was able to make, curate this thing that I have. And I never cut one off to do another thing. It was like, I always did all of them at the same time, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell yeah. you what, man, um, you know, just running down that history, it really was organic. You know, you, that, Absolutely. you literally did have a, a, a foot in both worlds, you know? Yep. And um, man, it's always a joy to, to to hang with you, man. I look forward to when this pandemic is It's already is over. over. I know, man. <laughs> yeah, well, we we got to we got to do a three hour. We got to do a. <laughs> I know, man. And yeah. and uh, I, I look forward to when we when we can actually play together again, man. I mean, that I know, game man. The was so much fun, but me, you enough. and Nicholas. Oh yeah. man, that was so fun. Matter of fact, I, I want to bring it back. They 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 want to do something. They want me to bring the the residency back, like in March or April. Hopefully, if things turn around, right, you know, right. we can probably try to do it. But I would love to do that again. That was so fun, man. That was that yeah, we'll do that again. Yeah. You a bad brother, yeah. Robert Glasper. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. As a part of our partnership with the Newport Jazz Festival, High Snobiety Jazz TV is raising money for the Newport Festival's Foundation Musician Relief Fund which provides financial support to members of the jazz and folks communities who are experiencing a loss of income as a result of COVID-19. Support the cause by going to the URL below.